Welcome to Season 5, Episode 14 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Robin Jackson on how to respond to rude, disrespectful student attitudes, particularly amongst older kids. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. So I have done a lot of Truth For Teachers episodes about behavior management. We've talked about creating a strong, positive classroom culture. We've talked about being proactive and preventing problems. And we've also talked about what to do about extreme and violent student behaviors. I got a request from a listener to talk about the annoying, disrespectful student behaviors at the middle and high school level. And I realized that I don't actually have any episodes about that. I've talked about how not to get discouraged by those kinds of behaviors. I've talked about how not to give up on apathetic kids, but what about practical responses in the moment? So today we're going to talk about the little things students do that are rude or disrespectful or just annoying, the things that don't necessarily warrant some kind of formal consequence, but that you just don't want to let slide every single time. How should a teacher respond to things like eye rolling, teeth sucking, muttering under the breath, that kind of thing? What do we do about bad attitudes? Now, I don't want to settle for trite, rehashed info, so that's why I reached out to Robin Jackson. I knew she could take this conversation to a deeper level. Robin was a National Board Certified English teacher in Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., and she's been an administrator, an adjunct professor, a consultant, and a speaker. She has been championing equity, access, and rigor for over 15 years. So She has seen a lot, done a lot, worked with tons of teachers and kids in schools. Robin is seriously one of my favorite experts in the education space because she has a deeper understanding of human behavior and motivation than pretty much anyone else I know, and she always, always keeps it real. I have had the pleasure of seeing her speak in person a few times, and I just hang on her every word. There's so much good info there. She has this lovely way of uncovering the root problem and also sort of calling you out on your own mess instead of just allowing you to blame shift. So grab a notepad when you listen to this one, because you are going to want to take notes. So Robin, thank you so much for being here with us and for sharing your wisdom with us. I think we should probably start off by talking about realistic expectations and class culture. Is there such a thing as a class of students, particularly at the middle and high school level, who don't give their teacher attitude when they're asked to follow directions? Is it possible to create a class culture where this sort of thing isn't normal behavior among the majority of kids? Well, absolutely. And in fact, how depressing would it be if that weren't possible? I mean, so I don't I don't just believe it's possible. I've seen it and I've seen it with all kinds of kids. So I spend a lot of time in schools and I'm in all kinds of schools, urban schools, suburban schools, rural schools, um, schools in the U.S., schools in other countries. And um, I've seen it happen, but creating that kind of classroom culture is not easy. So it's not, I, I don't have any kind of, all you have to do is, and you can have that kind of culture. There's, there are a lot of things that go into it, including not just the personality of the students, the personality of the teacher, you know, like a lot of times, one of the things that I shrink from whenever we talk classroom management issues is, um, you know, espousing a particular strategy because this, those strategies work if you have a particular personality. They don't work, you know, they don't work with some personalities. And so mm-hmm. we often don't factor in who we are when we're thinking about grabbing strategies and applying them. And there is no key that says, if you're this kind of personality, this strategy would work. And if you're that kind of personality, this strategy would work. So it's a lot of trial and error. Um, The teachers whose classrooms that I've been in, um, where that is happening, it's happening because the teachers created a classroom culture that's a good fit for his or her personality and for the personality of the kids involved. And I think that both are really important. And I think it's often the missing link that people have when they're trying to figure out how to create that classroom. They think that there's some magic bullet. Um, you know, I must not be doing something right. Or I saw another teacher do this. or I read something that this teacher said, and it worked for them. Why isn't it working for me? And we don't factor in who we are and how that how much of a difference that plays in whether or not a strategy will work. 
let's start by talking about minor disruptions, because I think a lot of times teachers feel like they should just ignore those if it's not putting anyone mm-hmm. in harm's way. Um, so they're just constantly taking disrespect without ever really fixing the problem. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have teachers who just issue detention. They write referrals, they get kids out <laughs> of the room if they even have, you know, if they roll their eyes at them. So what right. exactly are appropriate consequences for middle schoolers and high schoolers who show disrespect? Okay, so I think we I think we have to distinguish between disruptions and disrespect because not every disruption is disrespectful. So I don't think teachers should ever tolerate disrespect. Ever. That always has to be addressed. But a disruption may not be a sign of disrespect. So I think we have to be really clear about the difference. And I'm trying to think of, a, you know, kind of a, 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 a clean, easy distinction, but oftentimes there isn't one. You know, somebody, one person's disruption is another person's disrespect. But typically, I look at, is the child trying to challenge my authority in the classroom? Is a child doing something in, you know, in, in direct disregard for something that I've directly told them to do? That feels more like disrespect. Is a child being a teenager? Mm-hmm. And, you know, then that's a disruption. And so disrespect, I never ignore. Disruptions, I don't necessarily, I may not ignore them. What I may do is not directly address them right away because I might be able to redirect that student or I may be able to get that student reengaged. So I think that that's the difference. I mean, a lot of, and we have to be really careful about what, how we interpret student behavior because a lot of times I think in our frustration, we end up interpreting things as disrespect that were never intended to be disrespectful. Hmm. Right. Taking it personally. And it's not personal. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, you know, and and it's hard not to do. So Mm -hmm. I know that other people have given the advice, don't take it personally. I still struggle with not taking it personally. Yeah, I still work with teenagers even now and I know better. And Mm -hmm. somebody's attitude rubs me the wrong way or somebody does something that I feel is disrespectful when really there's something else going on. And rather than taking the time to figure that out before I respond, I just react and say, hold up. No, wait a minute. You know, especially now, because a lot of times when I'm doing, when I'm teaching or doing demonstration lessons, you know, there's a lot riding on that demonstration. I'm coming in and showing people how to do something and I'm supposed, I'm the supposed expert. And when somebody does something that's a disruption or even something that is blatantly disrespectful, it's hard for me to step out of wait a minute, you are challenging me. You are a 13 year old. How dare you? Or wait a minute, I've got to show people that I know what I'm doing. So I can't allow you to have any ground in my classroom. And those are short term solutions. And you might be able to quash the rebellion in the moment, but you have lost the war because classroom management discipline is supposed to be about helping our students become better at managing the learning at managing themselves. And when we sacrifice that bigger goal for, you know, a temporary uh, win, we, we create other problems down the line and it doesn't even feel good to us. It doesn't, we think it's going to solve that issue of that, you know, I feel disrespected and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't solve either of the issues. It just quashes the rebellion at the moment. I think a lot of teachers have gotten the message that we don't want to escalate the situation, right? We don't want to take it personally. We don't want to jump into the moment. Um, Let me give you a specific example that I heard from a teacher. I was talking about this in the 40-hour teacher workweek club with some secondary teachers. And um, when I told them I was going to be talking with you, I asked specifically what they wanted us to discuss. And I want to read to you one anecdote because I think it sort of encapsulates this main problem that we're talking about. So Mm -hmm. this is what she wrote. She said, I struggle with the balance of how to show the class that I'm in control without escalating a situation. Just last week, I told a student to move his seat because he was being disruptive. He looked me square in the eye and said loud enough for the entire class to hear, I don't care what you do to me. I calmly responded that we would have a continued conversation after class. He looked around the room and said, bet. I don't want to get into a last word contest, so I let it go and I talked with him after class. But I also worry that every other kid in the room thinks that I tolerate that kind of behavior. So how do you respond to these students' inappropriate behavior at a later time without giving the impression to classmates that you're condoning the behavior because you didn't address it right then and there? So that's a really tough situation. And it's it tough for a couple, it, it's, it's tough for, but it's not uncommon, right? No. So you have a student who um, you're dealing with, you, you make the wise decision to not escalate things in the middle of class and to address it later. And then that student tries to get the last word. And 
there's something inside of us that feels, you know, it's hard to walk away from something like that. You know, my sister tells me all the time, Robin, you're a one or upper, you know, like I don't like <laughs> letting people get the last word and especially not a student. Right. Mm -hmm. And the worry, we immediately worry that our students are going to think, oh, no, look, he got away with it. But, and so this is a hard situation and it's hard to kind of take the long view of things. Students won't think that he got away with it if you are effective in that post classroom conversation. And the next day he comes to class and he's well behaved. Hmm. So you have to kind of think about it from that perspective and remember, don't sacrifice the war because you want to win a small skirmish, that the, you're fighting a bigger war. And I hate to use war language when we're talking about dealing with children, but what you really, and I say children, but I mean, you know, teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's second, you know, I taught secondary. So that's what I mean. I don't, I'm not talking about just kind of third graders here. I'm talking about that 16 year old who thinks, you know, who's, who's being a jerk in class and doing it for attention and trying to, you know, at that moment, he is being disrespectful. Right. And so how do you deal with that? Well, the, the first thing is that you have to kind of keep in mind the longer game. Right. Is the is the goal of the of that exchange to 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 prove to the other students that you're in charge, especially when so many things could go wrong? Or are there other ways to show that students that you don't tolerate that kind of behavior? And for me, I think that that you, you if you let it go right then and there, as bad as that feels, but you settle it when you talk with that student later on and then that student comes to class the next day and is well behaved and you all and students see that you all that that student is being respectful to you then what students are going to think is oh she must have let him have it in that other conversation she's not somebody you mess with and they leave it alone if you don't settle it in that follow-up conversation then you know that's when students start getting the idea that that behavior is tolerated so you know Students are always watching, yes, but you aren't tolerating that behavior now. You aren't, what you're not doing is getting in the last word. And eventually that student looks ridiculous, especially if you remain calm and you remain mm -hmm. in control of the classroom. So that's the struggle is remaining calm because I know what that feels like in the moment. I've had those situations where you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh no, oh no, what are the kids going to say? And do I respond? And do I not respond? And unfortunately there's no manual for this because kids come up with all kinds of things that, you know, that we're not prepared for. <laughs> So there's no there's no way to prepare for it other than this. At all times, remain calm. At all times, remain in control. You don't worry so much about what other kids are going to think because you are in control, even of that situation. It's one thing if that student is doing that and you're cowering in a corner. It's another thing if students see you choosing to ignore that behavior. Mm -hmm. It's not that you are, 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 are tolerating or they can get away with it. What students will see is that you've made a choice to ignore that behavior. I, a long time ago, I wrote um, a couple of blog posts um, and the title of the series was, Are You a Discipline Problem? And it was directed for, at teachers. And it wasn't to blame teachers, but it was to make this point. A discipline problem is anything that disrupts instruction, anything. Which means that a child can be a discipline problem, but it also means that a teacher can be a discipline problem. And what the teacher did in that moment is she chose or he or she chose not to become a discipline problem. Because the mm. moment that you start getting in the last word with that student, you now are playing that student's game. And what you're trying to do is get the student on your page, not get on the student's page. So the teacher made the right decision, even though it felt horrible at the time. And then if the teacher follows up with that student and gets that student back on track, then that's what students are going to see. That's the permanent lasting effect that students will notice. I think that's really great advice. I think that's really realistic. And I think, I think that makes sense to look at the long game and to not oh. think that because you chose not to engage that that means that you're losing. I, I think right. that makes a lot of sense. And I, th and I think you can make it clear to the other students that you are choosing not to engage. Mm -hmm. So even in how you ignore you can look at the student, sadly, shake your head, and then keep moving with what you're doing and get everybody back on track. And that will look like you're just, you know, poor, pitiful little thing. You have no idea what you're in for when I talk to you after mm -hmm. class. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you can, you can do that. And that shows yes. that you remain in control. When the, the thing that makes you lose control, the thing that makes the student feel like, and he's trying to get you to, to react, right? Because then you're playing his game. And you just have to remember who's in charge. I am, which means that his 
this little bet, you just let it go, even though it feels horrible to do so. But you don't have to just let it go and act as if it didn't happen. You can acknowledge it without engaging in it. So you can look at it and say, you know, shrug your shoulders and keep moving with what you're doing. And then everybody knows you saw it, you've chosen to ignore it, and you've handled it without escalating it. Yeah, that that facial expression is really important. I mean, this was, it's a little different at an elementary level, but this is what I always did with my elementary kids. I mean, the look that I would give a student if he said bet in a situation like that would kind of say (laughs) it all. (laughs) And I think everybody has their own teacher looks, you know, I I like your point that it could be just a look of disappointment because showing Mm -hmm. disappointment is far more effective than showing, you know, frustration or anger or something like that. Or it could just be like, hmm, you have no idea. Whatever feels natural to you. I mean, it kind of comes back to what you said in the beginning, like what fits your personality, what works for you. Right. And some teachers are tough teachers. So like you're saying, you would give a look and I could, you know, I'm the kind of teacher that I could stop a kid in his tracks with a look. Mm -hmm. You know, I've looked at kids before a kid start getting smart with me and I looked at her and she immediately said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, just like that. So, but that's who I am. Right. Right. But there's some people who haven't found their teacher look yet Mm -hmm. or whose look isn't as ferocious. And so don't try to look, you know, like because 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 you know what that if if people don't buy your look, if you haven't, if there's no (laughs) conviction behind your look, then all he's going to do is say, you can look at me all you want. I'm telling you, you know, like that can escalate things. So whatever you do, commit to it, but make it fit who you are. Mm -hmm. So some teachers look disappointed. Some teachers look sad, but not cowed. Some teachers look at them and say, you know, I mean, the look could mean a lot of different things. So it could be there's just a look. Maybe it's body language, maybe, you know, or maybe you respond with humor. You know, some teachers might say, oh, do you need a hug? You know, and then Mm -hmm. the rest of the class laughs. So you have to figure out who you are. And that's why it's so important to do something that's consistent with your personality and not try to be the teacher with the look if that's not who you are. Um, You have to find what works for you. But there's a way that I guess the bigger point is this. There's a way to deal with it without escalating it, without saying a word that lets everybody know he's going to be dealt with. He has not won, including him. He knows he hasn't won. You're just choosing to ignore it. And if you make the choice to ignore it obvious, that's the difference. It's not. It's when we don't make that choice to ignore it obvious. When people aren't sure, are you ignoring it, or did he mm-hmm. just kind of, you know, beat you into submission with his words? Which one is it? So, yeah, I think it's important that you have to make that choice obvious, however you choose to do that. But you don't have to engage it or escalate it. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's. I think that that's the thing that they don't teach us about deliberate ignoring is that you don't ignore it as if you don't see it. Right. You're just ignoring it as if I'm not going to deal with it right. at this time. And that choice, if people see that choice, then you are still in control of your classroom. Another thing that I hear a lot from teachers is that they're able to get the disrespect under control themselves, but mm-hmm. they still need to communicate with the parents about it. And what happens is when they reach out, the parents, you know, sort of blame the teacher and, you know, act like their child can't do any wrong. So (laughs) what can a teacher do when there's very little support from parents and administrators to help turn the attitude around? One of the teachers in the club told me, you know, I'm really big on handling these issues in house. I don't like to send them to the office, but it's frustrating when I've tried every strategy I know. And the parents and administrators seem to think that the answer is for me to accept being treated like a doormat. Oh, no, never, never. Never. And not just because of just, you know, no one deserves to be treated like a doormat. I just think it's hard for kids to learn in that kind of environment where Mm -hmm. they feel like they're in control of classrooms. So it just hurts you. It hurts the kids. So never accept being treated like a doormat. But what do you do instead? So I'll give you a couple of experiences. I have been in uh, when I was a teacher and when I was an administrator, I was in two different school situations. So as a teacher, I would reach out to parents and I had parents cussing me out. I had parents slamming down the phone and hanging up on me and telling me, you handle school, I'll handle home. If you can't do your job, why are we paying taxes for you? Mm. And I've had parents come up to the school and lay me out. I've had administration administrators in the past who have capitulated to parent demands. Um, And so I've had that situation, but I've also had the other side of the coin as an administrator where parents are calling the school and their child can do no wrong. And how dare you? I've had parents, you know, get off the phone with me, leave work, drive up to the school in order to just yell me at at me in person. I've had parents yell at me on the phone. And so I've had, I've, I've, I've had the other side. And so I've learned over the years that there are a couple of things that you can do to enlist the parent 
enlist parent support. The first thing is that with parents, I find it's best to be proactive. So at the very beginning of the year, outlining what the expectations are, but also outlining, here's how I'm going to support your student. So that idea of handling it in-house is, is recouched as when things get out of line or if things get out of line, here's how I'm going to help and support your child. And here are the ways that you can help me support your child so that you lay out the expectations. When I give you a call, this is the, this is the script. This is how I expect you to handle it. And you lay it out before things go badly so that you have precedence there so that the, you're, it's not the first time parents are, are, are encountering your expectation for their support. That, that you've laid out what that looks like to you. You've had that conversation with parents at a time. You can do that back to school night. You can do, you know, in other ways. So the first thing is you always get out in front of the parent. The second thing is, and I think all teachers know this, you get the story to the parent before the child gets the story to the parent. Mm -hmm. So making sure you get that. If something happened in school that day, get the call home. Email is not enough because parents may not read their email before they talk to their child. So you really want to get this, get to the parent. Whoever gets to the parent first, they control the story. So <laughs> you want to try to get to the parent first so that there's an expectation. Third, I, I'll, you know, if you can't get to the parent first, here's what I've found. When parents are yelling at me, like it's my fault, I don't interrupt. I let them vent their spleen. Mm -hmm. And when they are done yelling, then I will come in and talk. Um, and I've been yelled at by a lot of parents. So because I, I, you know, I hold my kids to pretty tight standards and not all parents are supportive of that. So let them vent their spleen and hear them out because in their complaints are always the way to their hearts. Mm -hmm. um, so I hate it when parents yelled at me and screamed at me. I don't think that if parents are being disrespectful, so if they're cussing you, if they're calling you out of their name, out of, outside of your name, you, you can stop the conversation until they can calm down and, and then solicit some support. But in most cases, they're like, I, you know, I don't know why you keep calling me. I feel like I'm doing my work at home. If you can't handle it, you know, that kind of thing, let hear it out. In that is a plea for help. Look, basically that parent saying, I am having enough struggle controlling him at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't need, I don't need more of this. And so what, what I often do is I try to enlist parents as partners rather than tattling on their kids. And I think that's the most important thing that when parents, parents may be accustomed to the school calling home about their child and it feels like you're tattling or it feels like you're saying my kid's not a good kid. So what I try to do is talk about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it with this and using the language of the goals that the parents have for their own children. So I'll give you an example. I was, um, um, the student did something in my classroom. He needed to be suspended. Um, the parent came in and said, you are not suspending my kid, period. I don't care what you say. I don't care what he did. You are not suspending my kid. And he said it in front of the kid. Hmm. So he, we're down in the office. I'm not getting support from my administrator. And the parent is saying to me, I don't care what you did. You need to learn how to control your classroom better, but he's not, deserve, does not deserve to be this. And he's not doing it, period. And the child is looking very empowered, but also very embarrassed by the way his parent is behaving. And so I said to the parent, do you mind if your child steps out for a moment? No, he can hear this. He said, well, I mean, I really think it's important that we talk and get on the same page first. I'm not going to get on your page, you know. So we finally, I said, I, I think, you know, we need to have this come room. I need to speak with you alone. And so the father finally said, okay, step outside. And then I said to the father this, listen, I know this feels like the, this is a punitive behavior, but let me talk to you about what I'm hoping. Tell me what you hope your child will be. Tell me what are your hopes for, your, for the kind of young man that you want your child to be. And he started talking about that. And I said, you know, I have some of those same hopes for him. And this is why I think it's really important that he is suspended because what we're trying, this isn't punitive. I want him to learn a lesson. And I think we've gotten to the point where the only way he can learn this lesson is that he have a consequence this dire. And in giving him a consequence on this level, we save him from having to face an even more dire consequence later on. Mm. We have to get this behavior out of him. And so I talked to the father, not just your child did this and therefore he's having this consequence, but about the thinking behind the consequence. So I'm not asking him to handle something, which I think puts a lot of parents in an a defensive, you know, kind of posture. I'm saying, here's what I'm doing in support of the type of child that, I'm, that I think we're both hoping that your son become. And here's what's behind it. And so 
every time I've done that, and I've, I've had to do it quite a bit, but every time I've done that, I've secured the support of the parent. And then we said, now when, if, with that one, he's made this big show in front of his son. So now I have to give him opportunity to save face. And so I said, now we've got to call your son back in and, you know, we need to find a way for you to, you know, basically save face. So we talked about some ways to do that. And we decided that he would tell his son that he's decided to allow his son to be suspended. Hmm. And so his son came back in and he said, I've been talking to Dr. Jackson and he kind of used some of the same language. Here is what I'm hoping that you'll be. And although I'm not happy about this consequence, I really am concerned about this behavior. And I don't I feel like if I shield you from this consequence, you know, just basically that same kind of conversation. Yep. And the son looked at him and his son actually looked relieved. And he went home and he went through the suspension. And then we had the, the meeting where he came back in after the suspension. And, you know, um, we were just on the same page. So with parents, I think that the, the, the when you don't have the support of the parent, uh, when the parent it feels like their child can do no wrong, that you talk about the discipline, not as a punishment, but you connect it to the goals that the parent has for the child, to the, to the challenges the parent may be having with the child. When you do that, when you show the parents that this is not a punishment, that's what they're protecting their child from, punishment. Right. This is, you're teaching them, you, this is another learning opportunity. And when you do that sincerely, it's really hard for parents to resist someone who cares so much about their child that they're taking the time to, to apply the discipline, even mm-hmm. when they don't agree with the discipline. To- Robin, this is so good. <laughs> this is going to help so many teachers. I'm so I happy that you're so. sharing this. This is amazing. So. You know, one of the things that I, I that I find really challenging is that people will bring situations to me like this and they'll say, what should I have done? And the truth is, I don't know. I wasn't there. And quite frankly, things happen so quickly in the classroom. It's hard to do a postmortem. It's hard to say you handled this, you know, correctly, or you did it incorrectly. There's just so many moving parts. So I, when I see teachers out there who are sincerely trying to support students, I wish that I had a tactic, a magic word, uh, you know, something that I could give them that worked every time, but I've not found it. And What I'm hoping is that the principles, you know, like when I can't find the magic thing that works every single time, what I fall back on are always the principles. And the principle says that discipline, when when I changed my perspective and looked at discipline as another learning opportunity that I would treat with the same rigor that I treat of planning any other lesson, that when I'm planning my consequences and my responses, I plan it with the same intention that I plan a learning activity. When I think about what is it that I want the child to ultimately learn from engaging in this disciplinary activity with me or or working with this child to kind of manage behavior, what's the thing I want them to learn? It relieves me of some of the just natural human feelings around how the, the child is behaving at that moment. And it's a hard thing to hold on to, and I'm not perfect at it, but every time I've done it that way, I have found a way to reach the child. And every time that I haven't done it that way, I I look back with regret on how I handle things. So I want to do sort of a lightning round here where I give you specific behaviors that students exhibit and just find out briefly how you'd respond as a secondary teacher. And I know you don't like to give pat answers, and that's why I love you. (laughs) And I know there's a lot of underlying factors that need to be considered, but just sort of going off your gut instincts here. Tell okay. us your typical approach, okay? So okay. how do you respond to kids who are talking over you when it's not just one or two kids, but you have like nearly half the class that's talking over you? I stop. I mean, I mean and what's funny is it's not just kids. I, it happens to me when I train teachers too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I stop. I just stop. I, I, and, and a lot of teachers do that. And I just, I mean, literally just stop. And sometimes it may take four or five minutes for kids to, you know, depending on the class. I mean, a lot of it is I've had to establish something ahead of time. So if I'm walking in cold, I might not, you know, but I'm, well, I'll tell you what I don't do. I don't say, um, I'm not going to talk as long as you're talking because then they're like, fine, we don't want to hear from you anyway. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so I don't set myself up that way, but you know, I don't, I stop and I talk about what, you know, why, what I try to make a case for why, what I'm saying is more important and try to get secure their respect and, um, you know, and, and they're quiet. Um, but I don't talk over kids. I don't just keep going when, especially when it's half the class. And I don't try to say anything smart either, because that's just a setup. I just stop. Mm. 
And when people get quiet, I start talking again. What's your policy on profanity in the classroom? Not when it's no. directed at you at the teacher, but if kids are just casually conversing with each other and you hear a curse word? Oh, no. I mean, I'm old, I'm old fashioned. So mm -hmm. people have to work on their own tolerance. I mean, nowadays, the language is so profane. But what I do is my kids know that about me from the beginning. And so a lot of times I don't just say anything. They're so used to, you know, a lot of times they're just, it's just a part of how they speak and yeah. they catch themselves and they're like, oops, you know, when I was younger, when I first became a teacher, I, you know, was trying to st charge 10 cent every time somebody cursed, but that creates a lot of problems. So <laughs> don't do that. But, um, what I try to do is just try to kind of set a, a atmosphere in the classroom where kids know that that's not appropriate. Um, and then when it happens, I just stop and I'd say, you know, can you rephrase that using the language of the classroom and kids do, and they, they apologize. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. You know, because they know that that's not something that I really like in the classroom. What do you do when a student refuses to comply with a really simple request? Like you've asked them to put their phone away or you're asking them to sit down when class starts and they refuse. So when, when a stu student refuses to comply with a simple request, most of the time there's a bigger issue at stake. It's not just about the request. There's something else going on. And a lot of times it doesn't have anything to do with you on that particular day. They're going through something else. So if they refuse to comply with a simple request, um, at, I'm not going to stop instruction until I, you know, until I force them into submission. I'm going to get instruction going and then check in with the kid. Because um, if not, that's how you get those blow-ups. That's how you get you know, the kids who just kind of go off. And they were like, what? Well, what happened? Well, we pushed them too far. So if it's a simple request, like put your phone away, they don't do it. I move on and say, well, okay, I'll deal with you in a second. I get everybody else moving so that the learning in the classroom doesn't stop. And then I deal with that student unless it's become like a big disruption. So if they're loudly playing a game, you know, on their phone and it's interrupting everybody else's learning, then I'm going to have to deal with it because now they've created a bigger issue. But if it's just simply my phone's out, I'm not putting it away right now and you can't make me then let me get everybody else started so that we don't just, we don't, I don't become the discipline problem. And then once I've got everybody kind of moving where they need to go, then I'm going to go deal with that student. And at that point, it's not about the phone. One of the things that I learned from Cynthia Tobias, who has this great book on strong-willed children, is that when strong-willed kids don't comply with a simple request, a lot of times I'll ask, she says to ask the question, how come? And I've tried it, you know, like, so put your phone away. And then the student says, just doesn't do it or says no. And then I say, how come? Calmly. And a lot of times that can kind of... Um, that kind of gets them talking so I can find out what else is going on. So I'm talking to my mother, my grandmother's sick, or I don't feel like it. Okay, why not? And so you get them engaged in conversations that can help you figure out what's going on and help deal with the real issue and not make the phone the issue. Do you think that's a solution too for kids who are volatile and belligerent when they're spoken to about their behavior, the kids who can't accept correction? Yeah, I mean, and, and I also think that we have to, with those kids, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll say, we can't continue to do this. You know, when I, I, I have a job, you've got a job, and in the classroom, a lot of times you're reacting in ways that, to me, feel out of proportion with what I'm asking you to do. So I need to know what's going on with you, and we're going to have to figure out something else that you can do instead, because that, that particular reaction doesn't work. And you're allowed to have a reaction, but let's find one that will work in the classroom. So then we figure out something that works. So it may mean that, you know, if you if they get really pushed, you know, some students have had to do antiseptic bounces. So when they get really pushed, we say, OK, our arrangement is if you, you know, if you're getting to the point where you feel like you can't behave in this classroom, then you can go sit in the back of Miss So-and-So's classroom and finish your work there. And Miss So-and-So knows you're coming and they see the student, the student comes in, sits in the back. So I found that that works with some of the really volatile students. Others of them have a safe word that they say when they get really, you know, when they, when they feel like they're about to go off and they that's have a good. safe word. And then that word, a lot, that's something that's between me and the student. And when I hear that, I just say, okay, I back off. That student then gets himself together and we address the issue when they're calmer. So that's something that I feel like when I see that with a student, I have to work that out with the students so that we have um, an agreement. And then once you have that agreement, you can hold the student accountable to the agreement, even when you can't hold them accountable to the behavior and the behavioral expectations of the classroom. Robin, I know teachers are going to want to get more advice and strategies from you. So where can they go to learn more? 
<laughs> well, they can visit our website, um, mindstepsync.com. Um, and they can also, some of the principles that I'm talking about are in never work harder than your students and other principles of great teaching. And I think that when you really take that principled approach, you really cut down on a lot of the disciplinary issues that happen in the classroom. So they never even come to the surface. You never even have to deal with them when you set up a classroom in that way. That's an amazing book. I have a I'll link in the show notes for this um, to my review of it. I wrote about it a couple years ago. It, it is it could be life changing. So I'm glad you recommended that. Um, I want to close out with a takeaway truth, something that you wish every teacher understood about student behavior and attitudes and disrespect. You have a bigger end game than that moment where you feel disrespected. And it's not just for that student, but you're teaching, you're, you're constantly teaching all the time. You're not just teaching that student. Every student who wit- witnesses that learns something too. So you have to be very careful about how you respond to student behavior, how you address it, because in that moment, whether you realize it or not, you are teaching. And you want to make sure that you're teaching the right lessons in every interaction, because it's not just that student, everybody's watching and everybody's learning. So there you have it. Isn't Robin fabulous? I hope she's given you some awesome ideas to help you respond to rudeness and disrespect in the classroom. Have a fantastic week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Truth For Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's E-D-U podcastnetwork.com.